Castle was elected to mayor of the Fairbanks Star Star Borough in October 2015 and has lived in Fairbanks since 1975, originally from New York, where Mark, Mayor Castle received a Bachelor of Science in Physical Education and a teaching certificate from the University of New York in Rodport. Mayor Castle worked for the Fairbanks North Star Borough as, as Park Superintendent from 1988 to 2002 and was a director and director of Parks and Recreation from 2002 to 2008. Mayor Castle served on the Fairbanks North Star Borough Assembly since 2010 and was presiding officer from 2013 to 2015. So, Mayor. Thank you for coming today, and the floor is yours. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Do you recognize that guy? A, a little bit. That's snippets of some of the things I've been engaged in over the years. It's, it's been a good trail, um, and I've enjoyed all of it that we've been doing. I'm, I've even enjoy, enjoyed being mayor for the past three years. Um, it has its moments, but uh, overall, it uh, also has its rewards. Um, I'm very pleased to be turning the helm over to Bryce Ward. I think you're going to see a lot of continuity um, between the things that were priorities for me and prior priorities for him, things that I didn't get to um, in my term. I had intended to be a two-term mayor, and I was tackling uh, some things first term and some things second in my because you can't do everything at once, obviously. Uh, I'm not going to get to those things on my second term list. Uh, I'm not totally uh, pleased with retiring. I am going to retire this time. It's my third try at retirement. I don't do that well. <laughs> but uh, my wife is insistent and my doctor's insistent and her doctor's insistent that she slow down. And so we made a pact. I would if she would. And uh, we're both going to abide by that going forward. So. Um, I've kind of cut things short, but the fact that Bryce uh, Ward was a general contractor or is a general contractor, and I was for a number of years in this community also, and he has a very similar approach to things. He also values uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy and um, working with people. So a lot of the same priorities I had and things that I wanted to get to in my second term, um, he's a, a huge advocate for. Um, also, being from North Pole, he recognizes the challenges for that community going forward, um, which is going to be a hot spot in our community, obviously, with F-35s coming in here. Uh, there's a lot to be done out there. There's many of the issues. North Pole is the focal point, just because the way the numbers align with increasing population in 99705. Um, there's going to be significant growth. That's where there's water pollution issues, both from Isles and Air Force Base um, and from the uh, refinery site. There's um, also the obvious air quality issues are, at least on paper, are focused on North Pole. That is where we're seeing highest kinds concentrations of PM 2.5. Um, it's also where we're seeing the greatest pushback for any sort of regulation going forward. Um, so that's going to be a particular challenge, and Bryce understands all of the dynamics of that from living out there uh, and working with the people. He's, he's got a real good understanding of that. So it's going to be a big challenge um, for him to tackle those things. IGU, he clearly is a supporter of getting gas uh, installed. And on all the principles that IGU was founded on, and he'll be um, advocating for that going forward, as I was also. One of the things that, maybe I'll back up. So my first term, I really focused on trying to make the borough as efficient as we could um, to trim edges where we could, working there for the number of years that I did. I kind of knew where all the bodies were buried, so to speak, uh, going into it. So I, I was well versed in, in different areas. I could look for efficiencies and cost savings. Um, I hired a chief of staff who had talent in what I considered some of the weak areas of the borough. Our IT department is, is behind the curve um, from where it should be, and he's uh, got a strong suit there. Uh, he also has a strong suit in um, efficiencies of operations and, and having a firm but fair hand in enforcing different kinds of 
uh, policies within our organization. And we worked hand in hand trying to um, trim costs where we could without reducing services. We wanted to maintain the same level of service across the board to the best of our ability, but we wanted to find some cost savings uh, along the way because with the changes in the state fiscal position uh, and the reduction in money coming to the borough from the state to be able to maintain the same level of service, we had to get more efficient. So we really focused on the borough uh, organization and, and fine-tuned the machine quite a bit. And I think we did a, a good job of that. We changed some staff out that I think were maybe underperforming. Um, and uh, I think overall, the organization is in a very good position moving forward. And all of that was deliberate. I think if you're going to do well on any project or program moving things forward, um, you know, you need the support, you need the efficiency of a, a well-oiled machine, so to speak, behind you um, to get as much accomplished as you can. And, and I think we were highly successful in, in doing all of that. Um, and so I think that as Bryce moves in, he's going to uh, have a, a pretty reasonable machine. Obviously, it is going to need maintenance. Um, it's going to still need some oversight. There's still some staff issues here or there, um, not to the extent that we had three years ago, but um, there's still some work to be done there. But I think it will afford him the opportunity of more time to work on projects in the community. I think one thing that I am most discouraged about through my tenure here is when I campaigned, I said, you know, on the campaign trail and talking to people, they always ask you, what's the biggest issue? And they still ask me, what's the biggest issue? And, and I have been asked even today in talking, going forward, what's the biggest issue? And we, we have a tendency to focus on more concrete items, things like uh, gas utilities or air quality, um, you know, fiscal positions and, and things that are easier to put on paper. But I really uh, don't think that's the biggest problem in our community, nor possibly the biggest issue any of those in our state or even in our country. I'm really discouraged with what I'm seeing as a new trend evolving where we're getting more and more polarized and less polite in our our discourse it's no longer civil discourse um, i'm feeling a lot of it the past couple of days um, because of a misunderstanding people aren't giving anyone else the benefit of the doubt they're not interested in coming to the table to talk they're interested in jumping to the worst case scenario possible interpretation of some snippet they've seen on the news they pick up a sound bite we have people deliberately fueling that kind of behavior in our community and elsewhere. And I campaign on trying to get people to work together because you don't do anything when you're fighting and peeing on each other. It's like, come on, you got to come to the table and talk. You can disagree. I'm not saying that anybody's got to follow my philosophy or anybody else's, but you got to come to the table and talk and try to figure out where you can go, where you have common ground. And this is huge in this community. I don't think folks understand it. And I don't think they understand the damage that it does to our community by taking that perspective. There's a lot of secondary ripple effects as a result, not only of not getting anything accomplished or, or moving anything forward, but um, it gridlocks so much more than just that individual item. And it causes angst, it causes anger. Uh, you know, it's not good for your health. It's not good for the community's health. It is a huge problem in this community and it's not getting better. I campaign to work on it as really I felt three years ago it was the biggest problem in this community. And I have tried to lead by example by sticking to issues and not getting political on items, trying to do my best to stick to the facts on, on issues um, and hope that we could bring people along. As presiding officer on the assembly, I chatted with assembly members that were misbehaving in my mind as far as the kind of language that was being used and the kind of information they were pushing out to the public. And I think we made a little bit of progress with the assembly while I was there, but I think all of that is gone. 
Um, and I think the situation as far as the borough's rapport in the community has not improved one iota. I think we started to improve a little bit. But of late, the distrust, the language that's being used, the misinformation that's being pumped out, and deliberately so, um, is very discouraging because it's not doing this community any good at all. It's not allowing us to work on issues. Um, the current issue that's on the table that's annoying me to no end is um, we just had a recent election. I believe strongly in elections and the will of the voters, and I will absolutely enforce the will of the voters, although I don't think that the vote on the uh, two propositions uh, was the best for our community. Um, that's my opinion, my personal opinion. It isn't the way I am operating. I've already taken great strides towards um, implementing and moving toward the will of the voters. Uh, that was my position from the day of the election and, and after, and I have never said anything contrary to that. There are some questions that the assembly is going to need to resolve because as far as both Prop 3 and 4, that would be the tax cap and um, the borough's ability to work on air quality uh, enforcement. Both of those issues have legal questions on both sides of this equation, okay? Tax cap issue. <clears throat> they had this come up in Anchorage not long ago. Very similar, slightly different than the way our ballot initiative was worded, but it was taken to court that the proposition was illegal and could not be enforced. That was upheld by the court. Now, the city fought that, and the group that had put the initiative in didn't help with the city anyway. That went the wrong way, and the wrong way. Uh, it was flipped. The decision was flipped. Um, and that can happen here. There are legal questions on both sides of this tax, tax cap issue. If the borough implements it the, or follows it, they can be sued. If they don't follow it, they can be sued. Okay? I'm not taking a position one way or the other on which legal battle would win. I'm not an attorney. The courts will decide that. I've decided to implement the will of the voters, and we are implementing the tax cap, continuing it um, going forward. But I think that the assembly and some of the assembly members said when the attorney mentioned, you know, there are some questions on this initiative, on both sides of this initiative, there are legal questions. The assembly should understand those and what the potential is. Let's do your homework, right? Don't we do our homework when you're involved in something and there's emotions and, and, and whatnot? Uh, involved in it, you do your homework. You try to get the facts straight. So the attorney said, if you want, schedule a meeting and I'll try to explain both sides of the issue here from a legal perspective where you stand and the risks associated on both sides. I'm out of that picture. I'm not engaged in that picture. I think it is a very wise decision for the assembly to understand where they are and what both sides of this issue is. Uh, issue is from a legal perspective, I think that's wise. Now, there's no wrongdoing going on here, there's no agenda, and I personally am not promoting any side of this equation, although my email says otherwise. The public is well aware that the mayor is trying to flip the election. That is absolutely not true, and that's what's pissing me off is this kind of behavior has gone on repeatedly through my tenure, where I have never said or done anything, and yet the public knows what my real agenda is. My real agenda is to enforce the will of the voters, and it's never been otherwise here. Now, 
hanging this on me that I'm pushing this forward is a disservice to everybody. It's a disservice to the borough. It augurs the borough's reputation in. I could care about mine, you know, I've, I've ignored that and I'm not gonna be here in a couple more weeks, so it's irrelevant. Why are they hanging, trying to hang it on, on me? I don't know, I think because yesterday I sent out somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 emails saying, this is what my position was, my position still is that, and I will not be advocating that these elections get flipped in any way, shape, or form. I don't believe that's appropriate. I don't think it's appropriate for the community. Even if we had a legal basis to try to flip the election, um, it's gonna create so much angst and anger in our community that it's not gonna help us clean up the air. That's what my intention is. Let's live with clean air and get there without any more pain than absolutely necessary to get us there. That's what I've always strived for. And, and I think I've been able to keep a, a reasonable lid on it. I've pushed back to EPA um, and I've tried to find a common ground and a balance that we can all work on. Obviously the community disagreed with me at the polls. 53% said, no, sorry, you're too heavy handed. Okay, so we're out of the picture now and I'm not trying to change that at all. I'm trying to roll this program over to the state and the feds as quickly and as efficiently as possible. I'm trying to work with our attorneys to figure out what we can still do because there's questions about what we can do and what we can't do. Our grants, the federal money for our stove change out program comes through the state. Federal money goes to the state, then comes to us. It has a ton of strings attached to it. Part of the strings that are attached to it are enforcement. I can't do enforcement anymore. I, the borough, can't do enforcement anymore. So can I continue to do the stove changeout program because we're given this money on the basis that we're gonna enforce at the end of, of this? And if I can't follow through with that, can I actually swap out stoves or give people money to get rid of stoves? So the attorneys are working on that with DEC and EPA and seeing if we can either amend the grant or get a clarification that it'll be all right for us to continue that program going forward. I'm reading in the blogs and, and, and all the posts that I, my ego is hurt and I'm trying to punish the community for the way they voted by taking the stove changeout program away from them. It is absolutely not true. Um, not going there. I want to clean up the air. The stove changeout program works. We want to continue this. All right. So you can feel the frustration in my voice here in trying to get something accomplished. And the problem isn't the air quality and the technical end of this. It's this pushback from the community where they're making people angry as hell. They're going to storm the assembly chambers Thursday night with torches and pitchforks because we're disrespecting the voters in this community we're trying to flip the election really really and we're going to burn whatever we want i'm going to burn my tires in protest um because the the mayor is trying to flip the the air quality initiative this isn't helpful to getting our community moving forward, okay? This kind of polarization, this kind of misrepresentation of the facts, this creation of anger, that's what's frustrating me. Why are we behaving this way, you know? The facts don't support it. And I understand all the dynamics, you know, people, you know, we get defensive and we wanna burn what we want and we wanna have complete freedoms. Hey, I'm all about complete freedom, but when you're, you know, affecting your neighbor or whatever, we gotta work together as a community. We gotta play well in the sandbox. I've said it a million times since I've been mayor. Come on, let's just play well in the sandbox. Quit throwing sand, you know, don't hog the trucks, you know. Um, you learn this stuff before you're in kindergarten or you should, and our community doesn't do it well right now. That's the biggest problem we're facing. This air quality is gonna to get to be very problematic for us. The EPA is not happy. I had a bunch of meetings just before the election with them. They were here in Fairbanks and DEC. They came here <clears throat> to discuss how we were gonna move forward. And I said, we are gonna get a huge barometer here on October 2nd. We're gonna look at the percentage on this vote if they vote for the borough to stay engaged and, and we stay engaged by a 10% margin, 
that says we're on track, we're doing something right. If we win by 0.1% at the polls, it means we better tread lightly or we won't have the authority to keep going. And if we lose at the polls by any significant margin, which is what happened, I said, you guys are gonna make the decisions, not me, on what kind of enforcement we're gonna have, because now I'm out of the picture. And that's what happened and that's where we are. They were working hard to try to ratchet down some more regulation on us, on one side of this equation. On the other side, we had really good rapport. The number two man from Washington DC, EPA was here and we met. And he said he has never seen a community and an administration as engaged at the level that we were engaged, knowledgeable about the details, down in the weeds, and trying to legitimately work on the problem without over-regulating. He said everywhere they go, everybody pushes back. You know, EPA is a four-letter word. And they all say, no, that's too much regulation for us. He said, this community has not done that. We have said that regulation doesn't work in our community. This one's going to be tough to swallow, but it would help us. You know, it will clean up air. It will move us forward. So we'll try to figure out how to do this, but please don't do that. And they've been agreeable. They've backed off on a bunch of stuff. The public doesn't see any of that. They only see the part where the EPA has said, this is what you're going to have to do because this is going to work and there's no reason why you can't do it. It's worked all these other places and technically it works in your community. So I get it. That stuff's coming and more is probably coming. And the frustration that you're hearing in my voice is our point sources are going to be impacted, I'm afraid, now and we're not going to have a choice. We've been working hard. Now the point sources are power plants, big industry. Um, business in the community. They haven't been regulated on this uh, on the air quality issue because they're not really part of the problem, a significant part of the problem. Yes, they produce sulfur dioxide and precursors to PM 2.5. Yes, that creates PM 2.5 in our community. It is a very small amount of PM 2.5 compared to the problem that we have, and most of their emissions are put out above our inversion layer because they have tall stacks, and Mother Nature blows that to Ninana. So thank you, Ninana, for taking our PM 2.5 from our power plants. <clears throat> it's not a big issue on the ground in Fairbanks. Exactly what the number is, we can argue about it till the cows come home. But it's a small percentage. Whether it is 0.8% or whether it is 4% um, of the problem, so to speak, it is a small part of the problem. And to fix that is going to cost a lot of money. Okay. For each individual point source, we're looking at tens of millions of dollars for them to put on the kind of equipment to get rid of that little bit of PM 2.5. And when you're saying just the power plants is going to cost for that 0.8 to 4 percent. Yeah. 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 Will it make any difference? And it'll make a 0.8 percent difference in, <clears throat> or, or maybe 4 percent. We're arguing they produce about 6 percent of the PM 2.5 that is emitted into the Fairbanks <coughs> non-attainment area is from point sources, around 6%. However, a significant part of that goes to Ninana, as I described. How much of it comes down and is, is actually below the inversion layer in our community and what we're breathing and the problem is smaller than that. And estimates are anywhere from less than 1% to as much as 4%, okay? Science is on it is hard to do, costs millions of dollars to fine tune that question. Do we really care? I don't really care if it's 1% or 4%. What I care about is that as a whole community, we're looking at potentially 100 million to $300 million to get rid of that. Why would we spend that much money on that small a percentage of the problem if we could spend it more wisely to actually get rid of a bunch of the PM 2.5? That's where I'm coming from. Let's focus on that. And I have convinced EPA that that's a good course. They are trying, I had convinced EPA that was a good course. And let's try to work with the power uh, plants and whatnot. It's not an easy solution because of all the regulation and because we have diddled around for so long, we're so far down the regulatory 
EPA trail, we're up against timeline deadlines that ratchet up stricter regulations. When those stricter regulations come in, it could nullify any handshake deals we have with the power plants for this year. That's real problematic because you can't guarantee long term. If, if we don't get the air cleaned up um, by the deadline and we're trying to push the deadline out, or we were, we're not anymore, um, then these stricter regulations come in and could nullify some of the agreements that EPA is willing to make with the point sources. So we're still engaged with all of that to the best of our ability. Now we're working with one hand tying behind our back, so it's a little more complicated. EPA and DEC don't have the staff to get engaged in some of the programs we have. We were trying to initiate the ESP program. That is uh, most likely uh, gone away. Uh, it's a decision that the assembly and the new mayor will have to make, but right now um, we have to at least customize it because of the, the new our lack of enforcement ability now on, on working on that program. The DEC and the EPA have already said they don't have the staff to deal with it, so they're not going to deal with that. I mean, a lot of this fine tuning and local regulation, um, our ability to actually work on this problem, problem is gone. Now, the result of that means there's going to be a transition to the state, possibly to EPA. Um, there'll be a time where people will burn what they want and live free and happy for probably this winter because there's going to be this dead transition time. And then the door is going to get slammed on us. It's probably going to be all the point sources and it's going to be very heavy handed regulation coming to town and it's not going to be pleasant. And it's going to cost us a lot more money. That's what's really ticking me off too. Um, it's going to slow the whole process down for getting to clean air in the short term. Some people think, even on the clean air side of this equation, that ultimately it's going to get us where we need to go. I've been accused of moving too slowly. I don't know that I was moving too slowly. The vote on October 2nd said I was moving too fast. So most of the people in town think I was moving too fast. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not making an opinion one way or the other, but I can tell you um, it's it's not going to be as pleasant going forward working with the state and the EPA. And we're going to lose, it's going to cost us more money in the long run. Whether or not we get to clean air sooner, because um, I've been accused of my my program was never going to get us to clean air. It was It was too slow. We needed to ratchet things up. And the best thing that can happen to this community from a clean air perspective is that EPA comes in tomorrow heavy handed and says, this is what we're doing and we're cleaning the air up. And they will clean the air up when they get engaged. Now, they might get engaged tomorrow, so to speak. They may let the state noodle through this for a year or so. EPA's pretty ticked off with the vote and said, the reason we're at in trouble right now is because we took four years off at the beginning of this. We thumbed our nose at EPA and DEC and we voted uh, that we weren't going to have local control and you guys can just go away. We're going to do what we want here in Fairbanks. And so we did that for four years. And not that four years, the clock was ticking. There's a timeline by the Clean Air Act. We had 10 years. Well, we lost 40% of the time um, up front and now we've been trying to play catch up to get there. Uh, the deadline is a, just a year out, a little more than a year out for us to um, hit clean air, so to speak, uh, or EPA will come in. They don't have to give us that year. If they decide that we do not have a viable program to get to clean air, if DEC doesn't have a viable program to get to clean air by the deadlines, they can come in early and just say, you guys are worthless, we're taking charge, get out of our way. They may do that. They're coming to town next week for meetings, DEC and EPA, to sit down and meet with me. And we will, and Bryce. <clears throat> Although Bryce is transitioning North Pole, he's still the mayor in North Pole. So I don't know how much time he's going to have to spend at these meetings. I'm dedicating whatever time they want um, because this is huge for our community going forward. Um, there are clean air folks advocating open the door and Welcome them to town because the sooner they get here, the sooner we're going to breathe free. And we're going to go down this heavy handed trail at some point in time. Why wait a year or two years to go down that trail? Because we're not going to meet any of the deadlines in the interim 
so we might as well take the pill now. <clears throat> there is some logic there. I don't know that it's the right logic, but I understand that particular logic, you know. Um, the, the longer we wait to get this fixed, the more it is going to cost our community as a whole. So <clears throat> it's a tough it's a tough nut now. I'm not sure that the public realized what they were getting into with the vote. And a lot of it was because, back to where my discussion started, the real problem is this polarization and angst. And a bus bunch of misinformation has been pushed out to this community where it's not true. It's a misconception coming from folks that supposedly have inside knowledge of what's going on. And they have enough people buying into that, it's stirring the pot, and we're not facing the facts and the reality of this problem. Can you, I'm not in all these meetings, but I'm familiar with some of them. Can you, when you say it's going to cost us and it's going to be expensive, can you break down the cost that it's going to cost us, the homeowner? Can you break that down? Electricity, I would assume, would be warm. Electric rates are going to go up, so there's a lot of variables. The first thing is I worked hard to shrink the non-attainment area to the air quality control zone. Okay, So there's two different areas of our community that are uh, designations. The EPA wanted to designate the whole borough as a non-attainment area. We convinced them up front to make the non-attainment area much smaller. So the non-attainment area is kind of the core area, the populated part of our borough. That was still too large. And so during my tenure on the assembly, I, uh, Guy Satley and I created the air quality control zone, got the assembly to approve it. Um, and it's a smaller footprint. That's really where the air is bad. Uh, and where we're generating the PM 2.5. The big difference um, in a nutshell is kind of the Farmer's Loop Ridge, uh, north of there, Goldstream, Fox, all of that's in the non-attainment area. Mm. The feds want to regulate by the non-attainment area, not the air quality control zone. So EPA, when they step in here, one of the first things that's likely to happen, and I'm fighting this, I'm trying to get some data so that I can get them to not do this, but the first thing they would do is increase the footprint from the air quality control zone to the non-attainment area. So now all those people are going to be affected by all the regulations that are coming down, and they don't need to be. It's not just like the point sources. There's this much of the problem. We really don't need to go there. So there's a cost associated with that. There's a, a cost. Oh, what, what cost being what? getting into the non-attainment area and affecting those folks? Well, regulating all those people that don't need to be regulated. So there's a cost associated with being regulated. You're going to have to burn different fuels. Those people, instead of being able to burn wood, are going to have to do something different. Um, we don't know what that different is yet because we don't know if um, they're going to demand ultra-low sulfur diesel as opposed to, you know. so. The, the point is when the footprint grows, all the costs associated with these regulations grow to that proportion. Um, I don't know how to put a dollar sign on that one. The same with the point sources. Depending on what standard EPA wants to apply to our point sources, it could cost as little as about $80 million to $100 million for our community as a whole community to respond to that. What's that going to do to electric rates in our community? It could cost us <clears throat> two hundred million dollars to do that, or even more, probably not. I think two, about two hundred is a ceiling, but there's two issues with that. Rates are going to have to go up significantly to cover that. So everybody in the borough is going to pay more for electricity because it's not going to be just the electric rates in the non-attainment area. It's going to be borough wide, right? It's all the point sources are going to be paying this, the university uh, also. And the, the, another big part of that is what's Aurora Energy do? If it costs them $60 million and they have 220 customers, the rates would be if they shut down. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the utility, the rest of the utilities across our community? You know, I've got all these questions, and, and there's, there's even more because right now Fort Wainwright's on hold for development and expanding and doing anything because they've got the oldest power plant in DOD, the only coal power plant. They have the most expensive energy cost per soldier of any base in DOD, and they've quit expanding or bringing in any new programs, and they're on hold until we get this resolved. 
And if it's not resolved in a good fashion, I don't know how you define it, but um, they're looking at the numbers. They're likely <clears throat> to take Fort Wainwright and go to warm storage with it and use it as a training base and pull the troops out of here. What's that going to do to our economy and what's the cost of that? And we're this close to that sort of thing happening. It scares the bajingities out of me, right? They expand the area, the non attainment area. Will that pick up uh, Idelson? And if it does pick up Idelson, you've got a whole new. It doesn't. The non attainment area stops just shy of Idelson. Even if they, they, they push it more <coughs> aggressive? Because yeah. remember, they, when yeah. they first came, they had Idelson in there and everyone pushed. They had the whole borough in there. Right. They, so you, you don't think it's going to go back to that? EPA doesn't like to create new boundaries. Okay. Um, so they use existing political jurisdictions that they can find, and so they were use the borough because that's already well defined. And we said, no, 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 no. You know, the borough's new size of New Jersey, literally. So this doesn't work. And we convinced them, okay. So then they use the FMATS boundary, the Fairbanks Metropolitan Area Transportation, which is much smaller. But the northern boundary um, went all the way north of Goldstream and included that whole airshed. And so Guy Satley and I said, wait a minute. Um, well, I live out there and I know that the airshed in Goldstream is down Goldstream Creek. All of our airsheds here settle, particularly in the wintertime when there's no wind. They settle just like water. They run downhill. And so Goldstream Creek goes out to the Tanana River. It doesn't come into town. And there's a ridge between Goldstream and here. And those airsheds are separate. What was confusing them is some of the preliminary air numbers that DEC had were kind of swirling around Ester Dome. And they were having trouble predicting the exact airflow um, where Sheep Creek Road goes through the pass between us and Goldstream Valley there by Ann's Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. There's funny air movements around Ester Dome. And so it was goofing up their model. And when their models get goofed up, they go to the worst case scenario because they have a very broad brush. And they say, okay, if we aren't sure if it's A and B, we're going to go with A and B. We're not going to eliminate B because they don't have the staff to come in here and, and do it. I mean, you're looking at probably at least a half million dollars to answer that question. Is it worth it to answer that question? They say no. I say yeah. Um, and so anyway, we convinced them to get rid of Goldstream and Fox and, and everything north of that ridge. And so the the only difference between the non-attainment area and the air quality control zone is the northern boundary. East and west and south are the same. For um, it's it's a bucket. It's just how how tall are the sides on the bucket, and we chopped off the top part of that. So so, so for clarification, though, Ileson is cold. Yeah, Wainwright is cold. So you said uh, Wainwright's the only coal burning. Power plant in the DOD. So, are you saying the oh. Army or DOD? In the Army. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And so, Ileson's airshed leaks down the Tanana River and misses town. Um, and there's enough separation and dispersion that it's not part of our problem. Again, it is part of our problem, but it's such a small part that, that EPA historically has allowed us to not consider that. Do you think it's a low risk that they might try to expand and? That it would capture our I think that's a low risk and I think there's other more important issues for us to work on you know um, whether you know the impact on the point sources in particular um, <clears throat> EPA is, is very understanding of that problem the point source problem they're struggling with an answer because they have to meet the Clean Air Act that's law and they can't adjust that that's not part of their regulation there's some things they can change and some they can't and they have had virtually every community that they've ever had a PM 2.5 problem with, and that the list is like 60 or 70. Um, they have always said, don't regulate our point sources because it's always the most expensive thing. In other communities, though, it's a much higher percentage of the problem because they don't have a lot of wood burners like we do. You know, They've got industry um, in the lower 48. And so a lot more of their problem is the point sources. And so, EPA has never backed off on that ever in history, and yet every single community has fought that. They're willing to back off on that with us if we, but they have to hold the point sources accountable. They have to have a pass the red face test as far as the Clean Air Act is concerned because they're mandated to regulate those by the Clean Air Act. So 
So they have to do something with the point sources. They're very willing to be um, as flexible as possible here to say, okay, you know, it's going to cost you 60 or $80 million for your power plant. Instead, why don't you take 10 million bucks and put it into the stove changeout program or some other way to help clean up the air? And they can justify that because it'll have a better impact on the air quality, which meets the intention of the Clean Air Act, that they're actually doing more to clean up the air. And the amount of money that's spent isn't really what's relevant here, it's how much impact you're having on the problem. And so they think they can justify that and still meet the letter of the Clean Air Act law and pass the red face test and defend it against the next community that's going to say, hey, you did this in Fairbanks, you didn't regulate their point sources, you didn't make them do it, you can't make us do it. So they're nervous about setting the precedent. The guys on the ground are very agreeable. Their attorneys aren't as agreeable because they have to defend the precedents down the road. But we act, we have 100% support from the uh, regulator guys. There are two different divisions. Welcome to big government. And you might imagine that the attorneys have their own division and they're not on the ground working on the problem here. The guys from Region 10 that are here working on the ground and the number two administrator from Washington, D.C., he agrees with us also. He says, yep, you guys have nailed it, um, and we're going to do our best, but we do have attorneys we have to convince yet, um, and they were confident they could. Part of our problem here is what I mentioned earlier, the point sources are nervous because this could change downstream when we don't meet deadlines and we go into a different standard, we go from the best available control technology, technical term back, um, to the MSMs, the most stringent measures, and we hit that when we don't make our deadline in a year. We're not gonna make that deadline in a year now. There's no way we're gonna lose a whole year damn near in this transition. So there's no way in hell that we're gonna make the deadline. And so now we have these most stringent measures facing us a year from now or sooner, if EPA wants to go there sooner. Eric. Mayor, thank you for your service um, to our community and for your efforts to solve problems. I do believe that uh, your administration has worked to solve problems and not to try to polarize groups and to try to focus on a path forward. And I believe that. Um, and I think your efforts on the air quality is an example of a stakeholder group that was created um, to try to um, make some um, consensus based recommendations that ultimately the EPA accept. Um, I participate in this summer and fall Kumbaya sessions, which is what I call it. 38 members taking time out of all kinds of people. So I think I'm the only one here, but I've spent my, no, Clark. Clark and I have spent our summers. Um, doing that, and and the goal I've always said is to make a measurable impact on the air that is that is rational. Um, this point source solution is not rational, and I won't go along with it. I'll encourage rioting in the streets before I before I support a, a, a EPA solution that does not improve the air and foist the burden of this cost onto the broad public, increases the the cost of energy. And frankly, it's going to make the air the air problems worse because more people will burn wood. I mean, it's irrational, and and so and I don't think that we should get forced into making a plan like that because the plan says we should do it. I think we need to make a plan, stick on our because I think you brought the EPA along. They know that we're moving in this direction. So I hope that the way that we end up is moving towards point sources, saying we're going to help and push off these back. Um, because they're they're irrational, um, and do some other things. And I know there's discussions of that. We've been talking with with the point source board folks about wood stove changeouts and funding some of that and credits and this and that. Lots of good productive things. And I hope that that's where we continue and we don't take this vote in the wrong way. And I'm disturbed about the vote. I'm disappointed. Um, but you know what? There was no campaign on it except the no, no, yes campaign, no, no, yes, yes. And those are some of the right-wing folks, but they got out and made a campaign and nobody else did, so you shouldn't be surprised. That's how it goes. When people don't know something, they vote on what they know, and they didn't know much, and they don't like government. Yeah. So, I mean, I, 
uh, don't take that as a slap against you necessarily. I encourage you to stay the course, continue working, and I think the new mayor has bigger problems to solve now, but I, you know, he understands that. So I guess I just want to encourage you, especially on this point source thing. So I don't want us to get forced into thinking that the point sources have all of a sudden got to do this. And, and we may have to have a stare down with EPA. Uh, we've had it before. We did ride in the streets. I remember 30 years ago, camping out. I didn't camp out, but there were people who did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now there were people that did, remember? And and NDB and T B E and the feds were wrong and Fairbanks was right. But it took that kind of action to get them to pull back. So um, you know, I think you put together a good effort, stay the course, don't let the extremists I can't make you stay think the course. Everybody well we're not allowed I am not allowed <laughs> anymore to work on the regulations on this. We can't spend local dollars on the regulations, and so we're going to continue with the um, stakeholders group, right. which is on iffy, shaky legal ground that we can even do that. But we're going to do that at least till I leave in two and a half weeks. Right. Um, we'll be continuing to do that, and we'll see what we can accomplish. But I can't spend any significant amount of money working on new regulations because. That's specifically what we're not allowed to do. So it's going to get more challenging. Oh, I, I understand that. <clears throat> I just mean stay the course on your efforts to try to find it. That's what I mean. Don't don't be so. I just feel your heart, and don't be so depressed on the, how we responded as well, a community that you quit doing anything. It's the polarization again, yeah, because and I'm not blaming the far right conservative here on well I am but I'm also blaming the other side of this equation the clean air people didn't come out as you pointed out with any kind of a campaign because they're on the on that extreme end of this equation um, they think the best thing that can happen is just let EPA come in with a big hammer now and they'll get it cleaned up faster than because we were going too slow and not all. No, I'm saying the extreme, and Marianne, you're not extreme. <laughs> um, but we got a significant amount of that, and there was no campaign from the clean air side of this uh, um, saying, hey, the borough's trying, you know, and trying to find middle ground and, and whatnot. There was no campaigning except one side, and that polarization isn't helping us. There's a million questions. Yeah, let me get some questions here because there's a whole bunch of them. So let's start with Gene. So, Mayor, I want to understand, and, and I know, you know, the federal government generally says, okay, state, if you take um, primacy, you'll have more flexibility. Local government, you'll have more. That's the way they get you to take on that responsibility. Right. So, it, with the borough not having the authority, will the combination of EPA and DEC have the flexibility with what they're allowed to do under their law, the law, to actually steer money to uh, affect change at the residential level instead of the point sources? Or, or have we lost that ability to make the decision, let's spend 10 million there instead of 80 million on point sources? We've lost a lot of influence in that equation. Um, and it isn't cut and dried. They don't have the same resources that we have. Uh, they don't have the same knowledge or working relationship. I mean, I know the but do folks. They have, an ability, legal ability? they have the ability, yes. But do they have the staff? Mm -hmm. Do they? Because you know, they don't have any staff on ground here in Fairbanks yet. Um, they may soon. They the last meeting they were joking, pending the outcome of the election, they were encouraging a Region 10 administrator to look for real estate in Fairbanks to buy a house. Check the foreclosure list, get something at a good price so that when you live here for the next five years, then you can sell it and make some money when you leave. Mm -hmm. So they're they're planning to get engaged. Right. Yeah, I I have a question on <clears throat> on the initiative process itself. It seems to me there was a dichotomy to begin with, because as you first started out in your talk, uh, you mentioned that if one side prevailed, it could be sued and the other side or or the other could be sued also. If that's the case, 
how was the initiative approved? Who approved an initiative that leads to to uh, lawsuits at either end? There was so the attorney, the borough attorney, reviews initiatives, mm -hmm. and she gave the clerk a statement which is public. I don't have it with me, but um, she identified that there was. Uh, a number of legal questions about being able to implement this if it passes, and um, we should be concerned about that. But the way the law is written, the courts will not give you an opinion. They will not even review it ahead of an election. Many years ago, they used to do that sort of thing, but then the um, all of those, they don't want to spend a lot of time on all those questions if the initiative is going to fail. Because if it fails, it all goes away. It, 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 excuse it, me for interrupting, but somebody either has to approve it or disapprove the initiative process. The clerk reviewed it, and and it had it was reviewed for appropriate number of signatures, um, and and the process and the process was all done properly and legally. Whether or not you can implement that is a question of law that only the courts can decide and the courts refuse to take a look at it in front of the election. And our attorney pointed out problems in writing before the election that there were questions over whether it could be legally implemented as written and that the, that the borough would be at risk of lawsuit from either side of the opposition um, if this was to go forward and be approved. And so that was a the borough's legal determination up front on it, but there wasn't grounds for denying the initiative. That's a very high bar. The courts do not allow you to say no to an initiative, and they won't review it until after it passes. Chad, going back, to, going back to Fort Wainwright, um, talking about keeping posts warm, is that private conversations? Is that publicly known? Uh, I think about the EIS with the F-35 and the F-16 in the last couple of years. They have this, this list of categories on the EIS. Where is air quality in that analysis as it relates to the overall strategic importance of full rain rights next to JPAR training? It's not an official policy, so there is no official warm storage policy or whatnot. Colonel Fisher is very nervous to discuss this. Um, whole situation when he did a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce, he had a slide in his deck that he took out, and then I asked mm -hmm. a question from the audience on this exact thing, and he sheepishly brought his slide up from the back part of his stack and said, mm -hmm. yeah, we got some questions here, and there's no official policy coming down from the Pentagon, but the Pentagon is aware and concerned, and so that's the part, I guess, that's public. They're aware and they're concerned and there's no definitive answer at this point. But it doesn't bode well for us to be in this position where they're concerned about it and growth is on hold out there. Bob, um, I have a question here about MSM, the most stringent measure. We, we can sort of understand what that might mean for the point sources. What does that mean for the wood smoke burner, wood stove burners in North Pole or anywhere else. I mean, I could see, I could see EPA coming in here. I mean, they're going to have to arrest me. People are not going to have not burn their stoves. There's going to be, we, we are going to have a problem here. I, we are. So what, so what does MSM mean for the general populace? Well, it ratchets all the standards down. So the, uh, the levels of PM 2.5 that would trigger different burn bands, I'll try to use plain English as best I can on, on this, um, those thresholds are likely to go down. Um, there will be more of them as a consequence of that. There will be more of them also as a consequence of we really fine tune our model for when we call an alert and we've been very conservative when we call one. So we look at um, the temperature, the inversion layer, the weather pattern coming up, and if we're not absolutely positive that it's going to be a problem, we don't issue the alert. Um, then we look at historically going back, how good did we do? When we called an alert, was it actually bad? And when we didn't, was the air clean or did we miss it and it was actually dirty? And we're just off the scale where we should have called more alerts than what we did call. And EPA errs in the other direction. If they sniff an issue coming, there's an alert, okay? 
So we're going to, you know, all these are just steps to more regulation and, and how great is the impact of any individual one, it's, it's really hard to say. None of those decisions have been made, but we know the dynamic and they've told us this is how we operate. And they've commented that you've been very kind and gentle to your community with the way you've done these alerts and, and burn bans. They aren't kind and gentle. But but therefore, I guess what I'm getting at is our, our society, we, whenever there's a problem, our first response is another regulation, another regulation, another regulation. Regulation will do nothing to change behavior. I'm sorry if they don't. And so having burn bans does nothing to change behavior. Or with a very little, very little ticket. So what's I mean, how the only way I see they can get enforcement is to arrest people. Shut their put out get a fire extinguisher, put out the wood stove and take them to jail. Do you arrest everybody in the house? I mean, I, this is just bad. It's very bad, and we may end up there. We may end up exactly there. What I was doing is when somebody was burning badly, we would give them a warning, um, then we would give them another warning, then we would give them a citation, and I would call them personally, me, or my secretary, one or the other of us. We made 160 some contacts with people that where we were issuing them a citation because they were behaving improperly. At the end of the day, we were able to work with all but one of those people. We only issued one citation. The rest corrected their behavior. Now, I had to get creative with someone who was a soldier, and I said, you know, you're, I could tell he was putting me up. Oh, yeah, I'll take care of that. I'll go down, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay. So I thanked him profusely because I said, I'm meeting with your base commander tomorrow morning at 10, and he has requested that before we haul you off to jail that I tell him and give him the opportunity to succeed because he doesn't want to see his – I won't say soldier or airman, but, um, you know, in the newspaper as a result of this. And I said, so that means I won't even have to mention this tomorrow morning uh, to your commander. And his whole attitude changed. And he ended up at the air quality office within an hour of my phone call. And we moved forward with it. So the program was working slowly, incredibly onerous for the mayor's office. I've asked the EPA and DEC if they're going to make phone calls. And they said, just started laughing hysterically when I asked them that. I mean, I, we all know the answer. They don't call. They send a court order. And they've done it. The federal marshals back up the EPA. They've done it. They've hauled people off. This could be coming to our community. And it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. And I'm going to do my best to stop all of that nonsense because it costs our community more if we go down that trail. But right now, I'm not so sure we can stop us from getting to that because it could be very soon. The EPA is not happy with the way the vote went. They see that the community is uncooperative and not interested in working on air quality. It's the law. They're going to enforce the law. And we have to work on air quality here. And we're not. We're thumbing our nose at them. Well, Done it before, just did it again. Thank That's why I can't see how the initiative ever was approved. If it's the law and we even have a chance to go against the law. It's done. It's done. Rick, Mr. Mayor, don't allow the EPA to think that we're just thumbing our nose at them. That is a, I think that's an inaccurate um, interpretation of this vote. No, I do. And you're in a position to help them understand the implications for the vote. And I think the, the people didn't understand what they were voting on. And yes, there is mistrust of government. That's inherent. And we're in a time now when there's more mistrust of government. But I think to misinterpret the vote, to say it's an anti this so much is, is just, I think that's an overstretch. And just people that I've talked to, that's not. They just didn't understand. But it goes back to um, there were no campaigns to explain what it was mm -hmm. and, and except on this right wing. So we got to keep the EPA working towards a solution. You have a short window in your tenure to do that. We're going to hand off to a new mayor who's, I think, in, is well equipped to try to be the guy to bring everybody together. Good luck on it, but he's well equipped. Just, you know, I know you supported him. So we'll help him, but don't don't let the EPA think that. I think that's wrong headed. Because I don't, I don't believe it. I just think we just didn't explain it to people. Come on. So two things. A couple of the yeses I talked to were surprising yeses to me. Um, really what, what turned them from, from their statement was the argument of cost shifting up. 
that we could cause by by voting yes and removing from the borough the the ability to regulate those costs for regulation would simply would be shifted up layers and so would it save the borough money right. and thereby make money available for other priorities around the community um, that's a different argument than just you know a screw you but it was it was surprising I was surprised who who voted yes there is a short-term uh, validity to that I've already issued pink slips to a number of staff members um, I don't know how many we're gonna cut just yet we issued nine I believe but no we issued six um, we have to look at what we're gonna do going forward I'm suggesting that we do a monitoring program which we haven't done for a number of years out in Goldstream because <laughs> EPA is going to expand, like I said, unless we have data uh, to show them otherwise. So we need that data, and I'm going to repurpose some people who are driving the sniffer rigs in North Pole um, for enforcement. They're not going to do enforcement anymore. They're going to go out to Goldstream and get us some data out in Goldstream so that we don't have to expand the, the, to the non-attainment area. So I'm going to try to do what we can do. We don't know exactly what that's going to be yet. But yeah, so we are saving that money, uh, some of that money. It's not huge compared to what these other costs are. It's a colossal net loss for our community. But again, on the short-term basis, they didn't, they, yeah. they hadn't thought that far through. Yeah. Uh, I did have a question just regarding maintenance. Um, the way these votes did come down, you know, what do you think is the prospect for our ability to actually start checking that, checking through the list of the uh, deferred maintenance we have around the community? That's something else that also appeared to get challenged by the, the votes. Well, it clearly was challenged, and um, you know, it's a complex item. I've got a issue up this week for a vote. We're trying to get a maintenance software package um, going. Uh, any organization our size has one to track uh, all of the maintenance that's going on at all of their buildings. Um, hopefully, that gets approved and the staff to operate it. And, and deal with it. Um, that's a, a step towards giving us better data to respond to the public um, on the topic. It's going to be a big lift. Um, I'm not sure what the new mayor is going to do. It's all in his lap at this point. Uh, there isn't enough money to operate all the buildings that we have, and there's what I was doing was trying to. I had a 10-year program that involved um, many pieces to the puzzle, getting more volunteers engaged in adopt a park, adopt a facility type programs that's worked very well for a number of our organizations. So get more uh, volunteer effort and support. Raising fees, we have the lowest fee structure in the state of Alaska for what we have, so we'll charge a little bit more um, for what we're providing to bring in a little more revenue to, to put towards maintenance. Um, then I put more money into our maintenance budget and uh, some more staff members. We didn't even have a painter on staff and we were spending ridiculous amounts of money to try to pool little paint jobs. You know, you change the thermostat on a wall and you ding the sheetrock and it stays that way for months until you put a bid package together to bring in a painter to paint here and the next building and the next. So anyway, we got a painter on staff now and it's going to save us a lot of money. Um, and also the procurement cost to get there. So all of those steps, but a critical component of it was we needed one more tool for a little more revenue to put into this, either a bond package for buildings or the uh, number two proposition on the ballot, which was to allow maintenance reserve dollars to be above the tax cap in the equation. Either one of those got us where we needed to go, didn't need both of them, wasn't explained well to the public. The I put the bond package in, the assembly put the second proposition and after I put the bond package in. I thought that was an error, it confused people and um, they both went down in flames. Mm -hmm. And so the community isn't trusting the government. A lot of it is this polarization and the arguing that goes on that makes people angry and deal by emotion instead of facts. Um, I pushed out all the facts through the sandbox meetings, there was huge concurrence and understanding that we were going to need to work on this project. But then the minute you try to close the doors on a facility, there's outrage. The minute you try to raise the fees, there's outrage. They pack the assembly chambers and the assembly flips. And we don't raise fees and we don't close buildings. 
And it's going to all hit the fan here real soon because we've got problems across the board and everybody is focused on Mary Sai. That's the wrong focus here. There's people that are dead set. We've got to save Mary Sai. We've got to save Mary Sai. At what expense? Are we going to close the Big Dipper instead? Are we going to close the Civic Center instead? Are we going to close the Carlson Center? Something's got to give because we can't keep all this going and we're digging a hole. And we are digging the hole for another year now. So Bryce has got some real okay. tough choices here. We can't keep all of this going. And the problem is too big to solve it with a bake sale. You know, I get emails all the time. Well, do a fundraiser, you know, get the users together. And some of them are getting together and they're doing bake sales and that's helpful. But that's not the answer. You know, that's part of it. It's a step in the right direction. But we really need to change more of the structure here and get people to realize you're going to have to pay for what we're getting. The revenue from the state that we have gotten historically has gone down about $17 million. That's about a 20% whack to our budget. Nobody's felt it because Jim and I have found efficiencies in our operation to suck all of that up. So we're done now. I can tell you that. You're not going to save any more money. It's going to come out of services. And, you know, accuse Bryce or me of being punitive or, or whatever. You know, that's what people are saying. Hey, the handwriting's on the wall. If you're not going to pay for it, we're not going to have it. And we're going to be making, Bryce is going to make tough decisions, and he's prepared to do it. We've got the, enough spreadsheets and charts to show the math is easy. And Mary Sy is a prime example. And I'm really not picking on those folks because I said at the Sandbox Group, this is what's going to happen. I said, I'm going to make a decision based on math, and, and the users of the facility are going to explode, and they're going to pack the assembly chambers, the assembly is going to flip, and we're not going to close the building. But I'm going to tell you, you know, that's human nature. They're, you're in denial when somebody first attacks you. And so you just shoot the messenger, shred the data, and don't do what you know is proposed. What I did is I got a uh, table. Here's how many people, the visits to a facility. This is how much it's being used. This is how much it costs us annually to operate that facility. This is how much work needs to be done in the short term on that facility. It's basic math. When you look at, I'll condense this discussion because we're going long here. Um, Look at three swimming pools, and, the, and this example goes across the whole system. One pool has the least utilization, the fewest visits to it, okay? That same facility is the highest subsidy, the most expensive facility to operate of the rest of the facilities. And it's got the most work in the near future coming. So you do the math. If you're gonna close one of the three swimming pools, do you close the one who has the most users? Westcott Pool has the most users. It has the least operating cost, and it has the least work required to maintain it going forward for the next six years. Would you close Westcott? Or number one on the charts across the board is Mary Sai. And number two across the board is, is Hammy. And so we had a plan, okay, we'll replace Mary Sai and Hammy with an aquatic center which ends up being cheaper than keeping both of those pools running. You actually save money than keeping both individually running. And we maintain Westcott going forward because it's the least part of our problem. That was the strategy. Everybody said, that's great strategy. You know, if I put it on the board in front of you, every person in this room would agree with it if there were no names attached to it. But if you use Mary Cy Rec Center and it's warmer than the other pools and it has a jacuzzi, yada, 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 there's a whole bunch of reasons. You get passionate about your facility. If we keep that running, then we have to keep Hammy running because we certainly aren't going to do an aquatic center because that doesn't pencil out economically anymore by any stretch of the imagination. So now we're going to spend more money in our community and we're going to have a lower level of service because we're going to keep those two pools running. I get it, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on those people that are passionate about Mary Sai, but I want to tell you, the people that use the Carlson Center are just as passionate. The people who use the Big Dipper are just as passionate. The people who use Birch Hill, just as passionate. And whatever you go to shut down, those groups are going to come out and deal with it emotionally. And they're going to attack your numbers, they're going to attack you as the messenger, and they're going to get real defensive. And that we're going to have to go through that cycle a few times before folks get the picture, Carl. Don't raise my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. He won't. <laughs> I promise I won't. 
<laughs> All the traveling is well. There's 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 a little bit of light though. Huh? There's a little bit of light. Dan is on the subcommittee. EPW, uh -huh. Environment and Public Works. Yeah. Well, so, no, he's he's in the subcommittee in the the uh, the uh, Armed Services Committee. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's in the subcommittee, which determines the closure of bases. So it has been my view all along that we do the best we can locally, and then we're going to have to get some help from our delegation. We're going to have. And 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 we can go there once we've done all the best that we can locally. So that's why I participated in this. But this, you know, I'm part of this local thing, as long as it's rational. But I'm, you know, uh, this point source thing. So the, you're absolutely they, they've got to they've got to get that precursor. You know, you're you're absolutely plan, right. You know the and, uh, and even even if they even if 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 they apply the full six percent to the point source, it's such a minor part of the pollution problem. Well, and that problem. is, in the, you know, it's above the inversion. It's as he says, it blows off, but blows they off. never measured it. The problem is the EPA needs the science to be pocketed. Well, it's just the restrictive nature of the rule, and in order to modify the rule, they have to have a science project science, they have to have in order to proof. say here, even though we know intuitively it's not the case, well, they didn't do the science project before, which is the fault of the government, the borough, the state, they didn't do the science project. So now here we are. We're not going to put the bill because they didn't do the science project. You know that that's so we got to do the science project to get the data. You know we don't do that. So 